So thank you everyone for coming. I hope you're having a good Humanities Day and welcome or re-welcome to the Smart Museum. Before I start, I want um, to issue my raft of thank yous. So really first and foremost, thanks to the staff at the Smart Museum for all of their assistance and especially Barrett Ness, who's not here right now, but she's a wonderful collaborator uh, for incorporating collections into curricula. Uh, and she's been very helpful with my past Joan of Arc courses. I'd also like to thank the uh, Humanities Division staff and especially all the tech people who are here right now and the ones who are not here right now but were here earlier to make all of our equipment work for the people in the room and also for the people on Zoom. And last and really most important, I'd like to give a big shout out to all of my past students and my past graduate student teaching assistants in my Joan of Arc classes because I've taught uh, two different times, um, a course on Joan of Arc, history and legend. The first time I taught it, uh, one of my students on the first day asked me if Joan of Arc was a real person. And I think that it's an entirely legitimate question because there's so much mythology that has kind of um, accreted around the figure of Joan of Arc that you, it's, you know, it's a legitimate like question one might ask oneself. So when I teach the class, uh, we spend the first half of the quarter, more or less, just going through the documents about what we know about her life, uh, her history, and then in the second half of the quarter, we move into what I've called today the afterlives. Um, and so that's a little bit how we're gonna organize the class today. Just to set up a little bit, what is the state of play when Joan of Arc comes on the scene? In the 15th century is when she comes on the scene. Uh, and so basically what we're dealing with is warfare. So there is an ongoing war between France and England. This is the Hundred Years' War that you might have heard of or you might have read about it in Shakespeare. Um, this is already in about year 90, more or less. Uh, but then in addition, there's a civil war that's going on. And the civil war is taking place between the King of France, Charles VII, um, whose legitimacy has been contested, the King of England, Henry VI. Henry VI is actually a baby, but that's okay because the war is being prosecuted for him by other people. And then the third part Party, uh, is Philip the Good, the Duke of Burgundy. Uh, and all of these people are related to one another. They're all like second cousins or first cousins once removed or some such thing. Uh, and so we have sort of layers of war on top of layers of war. And imagine in your brain, the Kingdom of France. Um, and in the lower, maybe <coughs> third, uh, is territory that is controlled by Charles VII, by the King of France. And then we have here, uh, some areas up in the north, kind of where Normandy is, and also some areas down here, kind of in the Pyrenees and over by Bordeaux. These are regions that are controlled by or under the direct occupation of the King of England. And then over here in what is today the Low Countries, Belgium, Eastern France, and you get the picture, we have a big zone that is controlled by or under the occupation of the Duke of Burgundy. And so the King of France at this time does not control Paris. That's a really important point. He's well south of Paris and the Loire. Uh, and so um, uh, he's in control then about of a third of his kingdom. Uh, so 1429 is Joan of Arc's big year. Uh, and so I've ordered it both geographically and chronologically. Domremy is where she's born. Uh, Vaucouleurs is where she has her first success. And I'm defining success here as her first success in convincing a total stranger that he should trust her and help her. Next, Chinon, she undergoes multiple tests um, of her person. Orléans is the very famous, maybe what most people have heard about Joan of Arc, raising the siege at Orléans. And then Reims is the city uh, in France where all of the kings of France are anointed from time immemorial. And so this is where Joan of Arc succeeds in having Charles VII crowned and anointed. And we're gonna go through each of these spots a little bit more slowly. So we see that Domérémy is up here, just a tiny smidget uh, south of Vosges. And it's also in a border zone. So Alsace and Lorraine, you might know from more recent history, has been a region that has been disputed between what is today France and Germany, but what was then not France and Germany. 
um, but it is nevertheless a border zone. And I think it's really important to just keep this in mind if we're thinking about Joan of Arc's childhood because some people are growing up in a part of France where the political allegiances are pretty coherent. They're pretty consistent. You're in French territory. You're in English territory. Here, no. The people in the village over are Burgund Burgundian, and the people in her village are French. And so the experience of civil war is one that's being lived out by people in the fabric of their daily lives. So at around the age of 13, she begins to hear voices. And the voices tell her that she needs to go to France, which also shows she's not in France if she has to go to France, right? Uh, and that she needs to find the king, and she needs to save the kingdom. And so she doesn't act on this voice right away. You can imagine that. It takes several years, actually, before she takes action. Um, and just as an aside, all of the information that we have about Joan of Arc's life and things that happened to her, the vast, vast, vast majority of it comes from the trial documentation. But it's really important to bear in mind that the trial documentation <coughs> undergoes multiple revisions and transformations, both linguistic, from oral to written, uh, from different manuscript copies. And so it's mediated through these multiple voices and hands. And we need to always just remember that what is said at the trial, we can't, you know, we need to take a little bit with a grain of salt or just remember that it's a heavily mediated set of documents. Uh, and she calls herself, um, from the time that she begins to act on this broader stage and forward, Jeanne la Pucelle, Jeanne the Maiden, daughter of God. She says that she's been sent by God um, to save ki the king, to save the kingdom. So here's Google Maps. If you wanted to go from Domremy to Vaucouleurs, it would take you four hours. It would take you four hours if you were walking on that road. If you're not walking on that road, because it's the 15th century, it'd probably take you a little bit longer. And so this just gives you a sense of the scale of the journey that she's undertaken. So she goes to Vaucouleurs three times. Here's what remains of Vaucouleurs. So Robert de Baudricourt is the captain of the village and the fortress at Vaucouleurs, which is one of the only remaining strongholds loyal to France north of the Loire River. And she goes multiple times. Uh, and to me, three always sounds a little too much like a fairy tale for me to 100% believe it. But at the same time, I don't have other data. Uh, so anyway, it is said that she goes three times. And on the third time, Robert de Baudricourt finally is like, fine. Um, and he gives her a sword, an escort, uh, and men's clothing. And so with her escort in her men's clothing, she goes from Vaucouleurs to Chinon. Now, if you were walking, it would take you 97 hours. She's on horseback, riding at night through uh, Burgundian and English-controlled territory. It takes many days to get to Chinon. And when she arrives at Chinon, they do not know what to do with her. They do not know what to make of her. So imagine a 16, 17-year-old peasant girl showing up at your door and announcing that she is there to save you and your kingdom. So no one, I mean, no one wants to really condemn her out of hand, because if on the outside chance she is legit and God has sent her, you don't want to say no to the gift of God. Uh, but at the same time, she could be demonic. And so, so they're just very, very cautious. And so what they do is for about six weeks, she's examined. And I mean examined. They verify her virginity because this is an important point, both to prove the honesty of what she has said to them, she has said that she's a maiden, and also to prove her chastity, uh, which means that she's pure of soul, pure of heart. Um, and they also try to evaluate her religious orthodoxy. Does she know her prayers? Has she been baptized? Who are her godparents? Does she go to church? And at the end of all this, they, they, she seems OK. Uh, but they're really still not sure, so they decide that they're going to wait for a sign. And what they decide is going to be the sign is Orléans. And so they agree with her that she can go with her contingent of people to Orléans and that she can raise, attempt to raise the siege at Orléans. So a couple things about Orléans. Orléans is the last big city that's holding out in the northern part of Charles VII's territories. If Orléans falls, the English are just going to keep going south. And it's going to be pretty much a clean sweep. Uh, and so strategically and militarily, it's very important that they hang on to Orléans. But in addition, the lord of Orléans is currently 
in prison in England, because in 1415 at the Battle of Azincourt, he'd been taken prisoner uh, and had not yet been released. So just um, so that you understand, from cheval, like from a chivalric point of view, like a kind of code of honor point of view, it is not okay to attack the town or the fortress, the property, the castle of someone you are holding prisoner. Because by definition, that person cannot defend themselves. So you're engaged in something dishonorable, slightly sketchy. And everyone knows this, even though I think at the time there was a lot of conflict between ideals of warfare and codes of honor and realities of warfare and wanting to win. Uh, so this is, again, from the trial documentation, so to be taken with our grain of salt, uh, a citation from Joan to one of the illegitimate sons of the Duke of Burgundy who is defending the town and the fortress. God, at the request of Saints Louis and Charlemagne, took pity on the city of Orléans and does not want to allow that his enemies possess both the person of the Lord of Orléans and his city. And so for whatever for whatever reason, that really is not fully explicable, honestly. Uh, she is successful. Um, I mean, or she and all of the other soldiers are successful. Collectively, yes. Collectively, the siege is broken. Um, it is a victory for the French. It is a turning point uh, in the entire, really, Hundred Years' War, and in also the French Civil War, sub-war in, in between. Uh, people who maybe believed her to begin with are vindicated. People who weren't sure think, well, maybe she is to be believed. Even the people who did not believe her cannot deny that something unexpected, uh, interpreted then as miraculous, has happened in military terms. And so after this victory, what Jeanne d'Arc wants to do is take the king to Reims. And so here we are in Orléans, and we can see it's well south of Paris, just a little smidge west. And then Reims is up here, like north and east, again, like far, far in English-controlled and Burgundian-controlled territory. And so there are many advisors who think that it is a bad idea to try to go to Reims, that it's too risky, and that the payoff is not really that great. And Jeanne d'Arc's argument is that the symbolic importance of being anointed and crowned at Reims is essential for Charles VII, that for him to reign as king and for him to really assume his role as king, he has to do this. He has no option. So off they go. Uh, and because the news of Orléans has spread quickly, in as much as news spreads quickly in the 15th century, um, towns and strongholds lay down their arms. Many, they just are like, come on in, come on through, no problem. And so this becomes, in some places, an almost triumphant just procession from Orléans to Reims, where there's very, very little armed resistance uh, to the king. And all of this then becomes mutually reinforcing. The further they get and the less they have trouble, the more it seems to be an indication of God's favor or return of God's favor, something in any case. It all redounds to the glory then of uh, Joan of Arc. So this is a manuscript illumination of the anointing and I just want to observe that Joan of Arc is not here. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, tension uh, even, I mean, in scholarship, like people do not agree now, and I think people did not agree then, over what to make of, what to do with, how to incorporate Joan of Arc into a kind of political program. Uh, and so there is a lot of notable silence on the part of the king, um, at least a sort of public silence around uh, Joan of Arc. So, so then things start to go badly uh, after Hans. Um, around about a year later, she's captured uh, in Compiègne by the Burgundians and she's sold to the English uh, who want to put her on trial, not for any kind of um, secular or political crime, but trial for heresy. Uh, because for them, it is important not just to kill her. They actually don't want to just kill her. They want to discredit her. They want to show that this is not a divine set of happenings and that she is not a divinely sent person. Uh, 
So around about a year after she's captured, she's executed, she's burned at the stake in Rouen. Uh, and then a handful of years later, there's the peace of a house between Charles VII and Philip the Good, which puts an end to the Civil War. And then 20-ish years later, an end to the Hundred Years' War. And then just a couple of years later, there's what's sometimes called the trial and rehabilitation or the nullification trial. They really just say that what happened in the original trial, it's like it didn't exist. Like it didn't happen, didn't unfold. And this is important for Charles VII because no one wants to owe their legitimacy to a convicted <coughs> heretic, right? Uh, and then she's canonized, but a lot later, actually, in 1920. And you notice the timing with World War I, right? And the conclusion to World War I. Okie doke. So here is the only extant visual representation of Joan from her lifetime. And actually, it's really great that um, we have it kind of in the background. You can start to look at the, um, the sculpture on the right uh, because we have certain features that are shared. Um, and I would point out the sort of skirt plus armor a look that many of us sport. Uh, and the, well, hair of varying length, in both cases holding a sword, but not in a position that it can actually be used. Um, and in the drawing, holding a battle standard. All right, so you can just keep looking at those sculptures. Uh, so w reading the trial documentation, it's a little bit like a war of attrition. Like she's asked the same questions over and over and over and over over again. And you can, almost as you're reading, feel her wearing down and wearing out. Uh, and nevertheless, there are these phrases that are recurrent that, as I read it, demonstrate her efforts to push back and to resist the lines of questioning. And so keep going. Does this have anything to do with your trial? I'm not saying anything else right now. I'm not permitted to tell you that. And this refers to the fact that, according to Joan, God told her not to reveal any of her secrets or anything that the voices said to anyone but the king. And then finally, I've already told you that. And that's true, because uh, they ask her the same things all the time. All righty. So they draw up 70 articles of accusation against Joan of Arc. These are eventually kind of narrowed down into 12 sort of main accusations. Uh, and here I've given you just some of the ones that I find to be particularly relevant, especially in terms of her later reception. So you assert, Joan, that you've had revelations and apparitions of angels and saints. Um, this is very presumptuous to think that God has spoken to you as though you were Moses. Uh, and you assert that by God's command, and you have worn and continue to wear men's clothing and have cut your hair short without leaving upon you a single trace that shows you are a woman. The whole clothing hair thing is such a big deal to people at the time and people later. You can hardly imagine how important it seems to be. And also this second part of it, it's not just that you've cut your hair uh, and that you're wearing men's clothes, it's that you're not broadcasting in any way what your sex is, and this is problematic. Uh, and then um, I also really love this one. You assert that the saints speak French <laughs> and not English. I think the French today think all the saints speak French, <laughs> not English, because you are not of the latter's party. And so here we can see, we can imagine a current going into a kind of nationalism, patriotism, alliance of nationalism with religion that in some uh, later context has taken on very nefarious qualities um, and that in other cases has been uh, inspirational. And then finally, you assert that if Holy Church, and Holy Church, what her accusers mean is um, the church as an institution comprised of a clerical administrative apparatus, if Holy Church wished you to do the contrary of what you say God has commanded you to do, you wouldn't do it. And so this idea that she obeys God, but she doesn't obey the clerics who are carrying out her trial, this distinction that she makes is very threatening um, and very problematic for them. She is found guilty of heresy, blasphemy, idolatry, and also schism. And she is, like I said, burned at the stake. All right. So I actually think now, just because I think it's going to take us a little minute, 
Um, I'm gonna invite you, if you wish, starting here to stand up and maybe make one loop if you wanna be able to look more closely at the artworks that are with us. Um, that you can go around the back of the table and then down this side of the room and go back in your seats. The afterlives, the afterlives kind of stymied me. I had this point where I was like, which afterlives am I gonna talk about? Because there's a zillion of them and they're constantly more and more and more. Um, and I am sure that I have underestimated and underrepresented the amount of cultural production. And some of the afterlives are so diametrically opposed that you can hardly understand how the same person could have been uh, invoked as explanatory or exemplary in these contexts. So just to give you one example, during World War II, uh, Joan of Arc is held up as a kind of model uh, and inspiration for the French resistance, but she's also uh, made into the sort of poster child of Vichy France, the collaborationist government. Uh, and here, shout out Phoebe Holtz, whose final presentation in my class in the spring was on Vichy France, um, because that was actually not on my radar. It's one of the many uses to which Joan of Arc has subsequently been put, but it's a very interesting one uh, to my mind. And then I have just my tiny quote from Mark Twain. Joan of Arc is easily and by far the most extraordinary person the human race has ever produced. Produced. Definitely, I would say you could make that argument. So here we are at the Smart Museum with Joan of Arc. Uh, both of these statues um, are from the 19th century. And I want to say just a couple words about the 19th century, um, why it's important. For about a decade, maybe a little more than a decade, Jules Kishra, a scholar, uh, edits all of the trial documentation. And so what this means is locating manuscripts, transcribing them, printing them into printed editions, and then creating this published set of works that provides all of, at the time, what was known, what was available about what happened at the trial, both trials. And then in addition, Jules Michelet, a historian, writes um, a multi-volume history of France with a big chunk on Joan of Arc that also actually is published independently as a freestanding kind of biography of Joan of Arc and is very popular. And for him, Joan of Arc is this extremely important figure, really transformational in the history of France. She somehow both gives birth to France and modernity, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and she's also very feminized by Michelet. And so the two uh, sculptures that we have with us, they actually, um, the, the one further from me is made earlier. The one closer to me is the one from 1870-72. Actually, they're so nicely. This wasn't planned because I didn't know how they'd be set up. But they're in front of their respective little tickets. Um, and so the Princess Marie-Christine d'Orléans, we all notice that she's d'Orléans. And so she is a descendant of the Dukes of Orléans. But she's writing, or sorry, she's sculpting uh, before Quichera and before Michel. So she's really at the forefront of a rediscovery of Joan of Arc that's taking place in the 19th century. And Louis Philippe uh, is her father, the king, but not an uncontested king. Uh, and he, at the time, is renovating Versailles. And, and so he has asked his daughter to create this sculpture for display at Versailles. Uh, and so clearly it is playing a, re a role in um, the legitimation of his own rule. Then the second statue, 1870 to 72, a very different representation and called Joan of Arc at Don Remy. And so explicitly invoking the early part of her career before really Vaucouleurs and all the subsequent history. And so in terms of her clothing, her posture, she is very different in appearance from what she is in the later statue. And again, the date is worth noting. 1870 is the Franco-Prussian War, which France loses. Um, but by creating yet another visual representation of Joan of Arc and connecting Joan of Arc uh, to France and reminding everyone of the role that she played in French history, it's almost a way of pushing back against the reality of a military defeat that was very humiliating uh, for France. So we can um, go back to uh, the statues, I mean, we will go back to the statues, but I wanna, I'm also like sensitive to time, and I wanna make sure we have time for our Q&A. 
So, so the next afterlife that I'd like to talk about is a musical one, um, and it's Julius Eastman. So about a couple of years ago, I was reading in The New Yorker, and I read this phrase. It culminated in another startling a cappella moment, a rendition to Prelude to the Holy Presence of Joan of Arc by the avant-garde black composer Julius Eastman, who died in obscurity in 1990. At the time, I've never heard of Julius Eastman, and I cannot understand why an avant-garde black composer would have any interest in Joan of Arc. But I do not investigate this at the time because I'm doing other stuff, um, and so I sort of back burner it. I keep the note, but the next time I teach my class, I go back to it because I want to investigate. Like, well, what's up with this uh, Julius Eastman? So, and I hope that you're all going to go home on YouTube and find Julius Eastman because you want to hear this whole piece of music. Um, so. The piece of music, The Prelude to the Holy Presence of Joan of Arc, um, we're going to listen in just a second, not quite yet, <laughs> I'll tell you what, um, to just the opening about 45 seconds and try and hear what uh, the singer is saying. All right, which I hope it works. Saint Michael said, Saint Margaret Saint Catherine said, they said, Saint Michael said, Saint Catherine said, Saint Margaret said, she said. All right, there we go. Um, so, whoop, there. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about this piece of music. It's about um, 24, 25 minutes long, and it's divided into two parts. And so the first part is vocal. You heard just the beginning of it. Uh, the second part is for 10 cellos. Totally worth listening to, but we're not going to listen to it today. Um, and so for the, for the whole first part um, of the musical prelude, what we get is variants on St. Michael said, St. Catherine said, St. Margaret said, he said, she said, they said. And so there's this repetition and this insistence on names and speaking and speech. And then we're going to listen to it in just a minute, but around minute 320, depends on your recording, um, there is an introduction of the name Joan, uh, an apostrophe, Joan, and a melisma, which it, you'll hear, I'll, we can talk about melisma after we listen to it, it'll make a lot more sense, but you'll hear that the name Joan is extended in time and that the notes, that, um, the notes vary. Then at 6.08, a new word, speak. Then about a minute later, another new word, boldly. And then finally we get at about 7.39, more or less, when they question you, speak boldly. And I think it's worth remembering that Joan is questioned not just at her trial, but really throughout her whole life. I mean, as soon as she leaves her village and starts to try to say who she is and what she's trying to accomplish, people are constantly questioning her. And then at around minute nine, there's a real change in um, the quality of the music. It becomes much slower, it becomes much softer. So we're gonna listen um, to, let's see, Devon Tynes. So just as a, as a uh, rappel, Devon Tynes is who the New Yorker article was about, actually. Uh, he's, a, he's a performer. Um, and uh, so we're going to first hear him in voiceover talking about the work, because he does this little introduction to a video. So this, all right, here's Devon Tynes. This piece is actually about standing in front of people and imploring them to be bold in their actions. You were saying these saints were calling out to this woman to go forth and do her work. And everyone can be Joan. Everyone can hear their own saints. Everybody can connect to an entire lineage of ancestry, if not the entire flow of human history, and have all of that force behind them as they walk forward to actually do something bold. Yeah, I really, I like his introduction a lot. All right, and so here, then, um, we're going to hear the melisma on Joan, all right? And here's Joan Tynes. Joan! 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 Speak! Joan! Speak! Boldly! Speak! Speak! Boldly! Speak! Speak! 
boldly speak, boldly speak, bold speak, boldly. So part of the reason that I like, um, that I wanted you to listen first uh, before watching was really just to focus on the auditory dimension of the music. But when you see Devon Tynes performing, you can tell how much energy and strength and effort uh, is being required of singers, and later in the cello part, same thing, by Julius Eastman in this piece of music, that this is a piece of music that requires your whole body um, to, to concentrate on producing it, uh, like solo in the vocal part, um, but collectively in the cello part. Uh, you also heard the melisma on Joan, and this practice of melisma, this technique, is, not, is reminiscent of medieval monophonic chant. And so Julius Eastman is also drawing on influences and currents in medieval music with this medieval source of inspiration and combining them with 20th century minimalism to create this piece of music. And then the last thing I want to say about both Julius Eastman and Devon Tynes, in another part of the voiceover, um, I'm pretty sure, it's, you know, I'm confusing. If it's this voiceover or if it's another interview, it's with Devon Tynes. He says, as soon as I go on stage, I am a black performer. I cannot, I cannot get away from my body. And on the one hand, this is super obvious. And at the same time, I think it's worth really thinking about the bodies that we all bring with us to the things that we try to do. Because some bodies, when they appear before us, they already have credibility or they already have value. And other bodies, when they show up, they don't. And Joan of Arc's body, when it showed up, uh, was young, poor, uneducated, female, non-noble, was not a body with credibility um, or value. And I would say that for Julius Eastman, or for Devon Tynes, that this is also something that they have to deal with. They don't get to walk around in an unmarked body. So I want to listen now just to the end part, um, which, uh, Will, which I just also love. All right, so we can go ahead, Steve, thank you, and play the last little bit. This is maybe the last 30-ish seconds. Speak boldly, John. Speak boldly. Speak. you almost are not quite sure when he stops singing. And it's a very different quality of sound from what we heard in the earlier parts of the prelude. And so sometimes when I think about the, the structure of the prelude, the first part of it, the very forceful part, almost feels like an apostrophe to me, like an earlier stage of Joan of Arc's career where she is being exhorted um, by her voices to, to get a move on, get out of Dom Rémy, go go do the things that you're supposed to do, that we're telling you you need to do. And to me, this final part, it almost feels like a voice in your own head, where it's not sound coming from without, but it's sound coming from within. And I think sometimes about what it could have been like uh, to be imprisoned um, and to be confronted with all these judges, uh, to have um, the contemplation of your own end, whatever that was gonna look like. And I think she didn't really know what that was gonna look like till it was right in front of her. I think that something she did imagine for herself was life imprisonment. Um, it's kind of like at worst, I don't think she imagined being burned at the stake. Uh, and there is, again, I mean, who really knows, but I think, Possibly we should imagine feelings of betrayal, of abandon, 
of wondering where the voices were, had they fallen silent, had she done the wrong thing. And so this gradual hushing of the voice at the end of the song, I find to be both a kind of testament to what she has done and her vulnerability, but also something of a kind of fragility to which she doesn't succumb, to which she really never succumbs. And so this, for me, this is one of the most moving and also for me inspirational of the, the many afterlives I could have chosen, um, both because of Joan of Arc, but also because of Julius Eastman and also because the tradition of musicians then and creatives that he is inspiring in turn. And this idea articulated by Devon Times that there is a kind of genealogy or a kind of futurity to the potential that is opened up, the possibilities that are opened up uh, by the figure of Joan of Arc. So thank you very much. Hi, I, I recently read about Julius uh, Eastman and I was just wondering if his, um, did he feel like he was ostracized himself? Did, why did he cling so into Joan of Arc and wrote this piece? Because he, he had a rough life and he ended up dying so tragically. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, he is a person who had difficulty finding acceptance in his lifetime. And a lot of his music has been reconstructed post facto from recording, you know, from uh, recordings or performances, including this one. Um, and I mean, I, I haven't found in anything I've read, like I've watched and read now a bunch of interviews, but not all of them because someone just told me, uh, you just told me about another documentary. So there's more to read and more, more to watch and know about Julius Eastman, but I don't, so I haven't encountered uh, anything that tells me when, how, why, Joan of Arc in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never read Mark Twain's book on Joan of Arc, which he considered his greatest work. Yeah. First of all, I'm shocked that it's uh, so poorly known. I mean, I didn't even know he wrote this until about five or six years ago. So my yeah. question is, um, without being spoiled the whole book, um, <laughs> what was his perspective on it besides a historical tale? I know it, it wasn't nonfiction, it was fiction, but um, do you just care about commenting on his perspective on her? Did he help the cause or? I mean, it's really historical fiction. He does a lot of research um, into the life of Joan of Arc. And uh, I think that many people then appreciate, I mean, actually like, I, when I was younger, I read a lot of historical fiction too. I feel like what I first learned about the French Wars of Religion came from Alexandre Dumas. Oh, <laughs> yeah. probably like, anyway, not how you should learn about the French Wars of Religion, but that's okay. I mean, it's not the worst way to learn. Um, so I think a lot of people like that dimension. And then it's interesting, I read an article when I was getting ready for this, an article on Mark Twain's Joan of Arc. And the person had done all of this um, investigation into contemporary readers, non-specialist readers, like looking at Amazon reviews, looking at Goodreads. And here too, like to go back to to Lena's question, the, the difference in reception, it's like you don't even know they read the same book. So there was one comment, the author of the article quotes a lot of comments. There was one comment that said, Joan of Arc, she is such a wonderful feminine role model of self-sacrifice and devotion. And, and I'm kind of like, yeah, kind of, sort of. And then, and then another reader is like, and there in the thick of the battle is Joan of Arc, badass. And so like these two readers are somehow reading the same work by Mark Twain and pulling out of it what, yeah, like kind of the Joan of Arc they need, maybe, or features of what's in the work that respond to what interests them, what's important to them. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it's very subjective, what you're saying. Yeah, but that seems to be true with all the material. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the trial of Joan of Arc was the one of the best documented one up up until that time. So I found this very interesting. Is it? Do you think it is, like, do you think it is because of some special, um, re uh, some special like, reason? Is there any specialties in John, in the figure of John of Arc which made this trial so important? Maybe, or is it just just a coincidence? I think um, no. I think there is, and I think there's really two different things happening. One has to do really more with religion and with something that is called the discernment of spirits and with a recent sort of spate of visionaries, some of whom 
are accepted as being legitimate visionaries, others of whom are burned at the stake. And so I think the church has a lot of concern about people just asserting that they heard X, Y, or Z from God when the church hasn't verified it or agreed with it. or So there's a whole um, kind of practice, discernment, that is developed around figuring out how to determine whether someone's visions are um, orthodox, legitimate, or whether that person is heretical. So there's kind of one side of it. And then the other side of it is just the political side of it, that for the English, this is supremely important. I mean, the English have to have this trial go this certain way. Um, at a certain point, Joan of Arc gets sick, and the English send in all these doctors because they're like, we can't have her die a natural death. Like, sh we, like she needs to be killed. Yeah, like we need her to die the death. We need her to die. And so I think that as part of a kind of political effort then to delegitimize um, the French uh, and Joan of Arc, she needs to be found guilty and she needs to be punished in this like uh, super exemplary way. Yeah. We have a question from a remote participant. Um, oh, there's someone on oh. Zoom, Rosalie. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, was Joan of Arc considered a martyr by the people of the Kingdom of France at the time of her execution, or is that a perception that has accrued over time? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. And she's definitely, by some people, definitely considered a martyr right away. I mean, in the trial for rehabilitation, and again, grains of salt, but in the trial for rehabilitation, um, someone says that it was said at the time, you've killed a saint. Uh, and so not only is she a martyr, she's already a saint in the 15th century, even though she's not. But one of the, one of the accusations, actually, that's made against her is that people do begin to venerate her during her lifetime. People want to touch her. They want to touch her clothing. Um, and so among some people, she has really already attained a kind of divine status during her life. And I think that, I mean, the English, I feel like the English, if they thought about this for a minute, or I don't know, part of me is like, this went so wrong for you people. Like, all you did was create a huge martyr. Like, you did not succeed in killing a heretic, you know? So the PR move that they were hoping for went really like a complete 180 from their objectives. Um, yeah, so that, so that didn't, that didn't work well. You know, kind of a, a little of a follow-up question on that. Is there any specula speculation as to why it took so long to have her canonized? Because it's kind of ironic that when the trial was occurring, yeah. the English were, in a sense, they're, they're accusing her of heresy. Mm -hmm. they're, per they're defenders of the church. But then in the next century, they become heretics themselves in the eyes of the church by like what Henry VIII was doing. So that I, I, you know, I just wonder what influences were put in place, perhaps, for if there was this belief by a lot of people in France that no, she was a saint, that it took so long for that official recognition to be conferred on her. Yeah, I think that, I mean, to be honest, she falls a little bit by the wayside. I mean, here's her giant victory, but then she's died, everyone, you know, things move on. Um, and. I would say that there is relatively, there is some textual production in the 16th century, less in the 17th century around Joan of Arc. But in the 18th century, Voltaire writes like this scathing, like send up of Joan of Arc, basically saying that she's a whore of the army and like making fun of her. She's just a credulous, like, because also, um, he has a more secular position. And so the power of the church is something he's pushing back against. Uh, and so then in the 19th century, she undergoes, I would say, a massive artistic rehabilitation. But then it doesn't, and, and like, why 1920? I mean, yes, World War I, um, but why not, say, earlier? I honestly, I don't know. That's not something I've done enough research into. I don't actually even know who initially, like someone has to spearhead these things, right? Uh, and I don't know who like decided now was the moment, and they had to get it done. Um, there were two people in the front. Back to your uh, back to kind of piggyback what he just said. Uh, this was obviously a, you, know, you know two countries, France, France and England, um, basically at each other's throats within the construct of the church. I was just curious, how did the Holy See in Rome view Joan of Arc? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how did the popes view Joan of Arc? Over the course of her trial, Joan asks multiple times for the intervention of the pope. She's like, let's have the pope come, and, and, I, and I can talk to him. And they're like, no, no, <laughs> we're, not, we're not inviting the pope in here. I mean, to be honest, the popes don't intervene. Um, and, and this is an ecclesiastical trial, right? I mean, this is, this is the church militant carrying out this trial. Uh, yeah. Today, now? Oh, yeah, she is now today. Yeah. Centuries later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, if instead of Jean d'Arc it was Robert d'Arc, how do you think history would change and how do you think the afterlives would have occurred? Uh, occurred? Yeah, I'm not sure that Robert d'Arc would have. Um, been able to pull it off, actually. I think that part of what is miraculous, precisely, is her very improbability. And there's a lot of insistence um, on the fact that she's female, and so her partisans will, in fact, her partisans and her detractors both, like, will say, like, how could, how could someone do these things, you know? So, so for the partisans of Joan of Arc, the fact that a, a feeble instrument, like a woman, um, could be the means through which France is saved, it's just a way to reinforce that it's really God, that it's really all about God. It's not about Joan at all. Um, and so I think all of the factors that make her weak are the factors that allow her to have done what she did, so including her femininity. Yeah, but then the femaleness will be a giant obstacle again during her trial because she does not um, submit to hierarchical authorities, either men or church or churchmen, <laughs> and so so yeah, she's not doing what she should be doing as a woman. All right. Well, thank you again very much for coming, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.